Welcome again to Discipleship Empowerment Word, and we're glad that you've joined us again today. We're looking a little bit further away than usual, but the reason is because our, our evening today is going to be centered again on communion. And you can see we have our communion uh, emblems ready for later on in our service time. But first of all, we're going to talk about our Discipleship Empowerment Word, and it's got to do with the blood today. As we look at this word blood, we'll see the uniqueness and how it is a gem and how, well, in reality, it's so, so important for the disciple of Christ to understand the importance of the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, of course, that's our theme word for tonight, our little gem and pearl, but it also ties in quite well with communion because we remember the broken body and his shed blood. And so as we begin our study tonight, we're glad that you've joined us. We pray that the Lord is going to bless your day and has blessed your day and that you're going to continue to grow and mature in him. Amen. We're just so thankful that each night that you come and, or each morning, depending on what it is or through the day, that you come and spend a little bit of time with us. And we hope that these words are helping you to grow in your discipleship faith. Amen. So as we begin our journey concerning the word blood, we're going to go starting, it's not where the first place it starts in the Bible, but it's where we're going to start tonight is in Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, verse 7, where we have Moses speaking to us about the blood. And he says, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. And you know, this goes right back to the beginning of the Passover. You know, there was a plague that had gone through Egypt, and Pharaoh was still refusing to let the people go. But God was continuing to speak to Moses and told him what would take place. And Pharaoh, you know, gave a, a, a word to Moses. And because of that, we have the death of the firstborn, but we also have the salvation and the redemption of the firstborn of Israel. But that took place by the shedding of blood. You, I mean, we need to understand that right from the very beginning, the purpose of the shedding of the blood was for remissions, for the covering over. And so when he said here that they were to kill a, a, a spot-free lamb uh, without blemish, and then they were to take that blood and use a hyssop and then to spread it up over the doorpost and the mantle and the, of their home where they ate and it was supposed to be where they ate it was where they fellowship together as a family and when the death angel would go by it would see the blood because they were covered in the blood then this idea of blood continues on as they move into the further along as they are, are still in the wilderness but now they build a tabernacle and now they of course they take time to dedicate all the furnitures of the tabernacle and the tabernacle itself but also they're going to dedicate the priest. And it's unusual how they dedicate the priest. And again, it's interesting that the blood seems to be like, as it were, the covering between whoever the person was because of their iniquity and sin at that time and God himself. Because it says here in 2920, Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear, of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons and on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right foot and sprinkle the blood all around the altar. Now that's kind of an unusual thing but the idea was that first of all that you would put it on the ear so that it would cover your hearing that what was going to go into your mind that it would be the idea of covering the thoughts of your mind that they would be pure before the Lord. And with the hand is whatever you would do or create or even extend to others, that your hand would be covered. And then the idea of on the big toe, it gave the idea that wherever the priest went, he would be he would be walking on, on the ground. And it reminds me of how in Romans chapter 10, it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring the good news. And in reality, what God was doing and telling Moses to do is that the priest had to be covered with the blood. 
And it's interesting, that's a forerunning of the story of how we also need to be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so here it was to cover their, put some on their ear, some on their thumb, and some on their big toe. And uh, that covering allowed them to be able to serve the Lord and even for the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies. Again, so we, we have the, the idea how they were protected, first of all, when it came to the Passover. Then when it came to the tabernacle, how the priest could be protected. And then as we go over into Leviticus 17.11, we talk so again about the, the tabernacle, but this time the altar. It says in 17.11, for the, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And that's the important part. It makes atonement. It makes a cleansing, a washing over for our soul at that time it was used there. And, and the thing is that it, the, the idea was is something else had to give its blood. Something that was pure, something that was innocent. And a lamb often was pure and innocent. It had done nothing wrong. Lambs don't attack people. They don't do anything. In fact, they probably cause, you know, a, a lot of problems for the shepherd. But in the reality, they were just loving, peaceful, quiet animals. And they had to give their blood. And their giving of their blood was an atonement for the sins of the people. Now, again, we have the, the, the Passover lamb. That was needed so that we would not suffer death but have eternal life that's what Jesus did for us he became our Passover lamb then he became our high priest where he was anointed by the Father to stand in the gap on behalf of us and then we also know that he was sacrificed a cruel death and his blood was sprinkled over the altar and his blood was pure and innocent. And because of that, he could be then the sacrifice for us. So we got those three areas as we travel through, just to get the kind of the, the background of what the blood is all about. So again, remember, you know, it was for the Passover, it was for the priest, and it was for the tabernacle where the blood could be shed. And then as we now move from the Old Testament... The Old Testament can be known as the Old Covenant, and also the New Testament becomes known as the New Covenant. And that's important because when we take communion, Jesus himself said, this is my New Covenant. So under the Old Covenant, this is how they did things for atonement for sins. But as it moves into the New Covenant, because of the Lamb who was the innocent Lamb, the pure Lamb, the lamb without spot or, 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 or blemish on him was able to then die and shed his blood for us. And that now becomes part of the new covenant. John 6, 54, he says, Whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Now, he's not talking about physical eating of his flesh and blood, but he's talking about the whole idea of the spiritual that those who believe in him and partake of, of together with him will have eternal life. And even we know, sometimes people say, well, Jesus wasn't really a man. He was just God. No, he was the son of God and he was the son of man. And I bring this verse up in John 19, 34, just to remind us that when Jesus was on the cross, of course, he's shedding his blood through the nails within his hands and the nails within his, his feet. But also that after that, he gave up the Holy Ghost, that his side was pierced. And the Bible tells us out of his side came blood. He says in verse 34 of 19 in John, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And that was a prophecy that was being fulfilled that was given to us in Isaiah. And also some parts of the, of the psalm that this would take place. And uh, 
we need to remember that, that, that Jesus shed real blood, not spiritual blood or emotional blood, but physical blood as an atonement for us. And as we continue on, we're going to see what that blood represented as we move along. Because over in Acts 20, 28, as we continue to look at this idea of blood, it says, Therefore take heed of yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Well, who is the he? Jesus Christ. See, on the day of Pentecost, the church was born, birthed forth. And at that moment, the bride was beginning to be prepared for the second coming of the Lord. But to remember that the church itself was purchased. You know, what was the price of the church? What was the price of you and me? The price was the blood of Jesus Christ. What was the price that needed to be paid for Passover? That a lamb would be sacrificed and that it would be innocent and its blood would be put over the doorpost and over the altar so that the people in the house would be protected. We ourselves were going to have the shedding of the blood so that we could become part of the body of Christ. In Romans 3.23, or Romans, I should say, 3.25, it says to us, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because he, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. So just again, there is that word Passover that, you know, because of what took place, what was happening, because we were born in trespasses and sins, because of what Jesus has done, the death angel will pass over us because we're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's an amazing truth that we need to be hold, hold on to. And because of that, we then have his righteousness. We're putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Then in Romans 5, 9, he says to us, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we have been saved from wrath through him. So we can now stand before the Lord, not guilty. Yes, we're all going to come before the judgment seat of the Lord. But when, the, when God the Father looks at us, he will look at us because in a way that we are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. And are now, because of Christ's innocence, we are also innocent before the Lord. And because of that, we have been justified, not by what we have done, but what he has done through the shedding of his blood. Then Paul talks about this to the Ephesian church, reminding them of how they got their redemption. You know, the church, and sometimes we need to have a big sign up. You know, you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Your redemption has come through the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. It's not of works. It's not of anything that we've been able to do. And so Paul reminds the Ephesian church, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So we have all this, the riches of his grace, the redemption that he has given to us. Why? Because the perfect lamb shed his blood for us. He says again in 2.13, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, in whom once we're far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. To me, that's a, that's a reference about those of us who were Gentile. We were far off. We had nothing to do with God. We were aliens and strangers. But because of what Jesus has done, now we're not afar off, but we've been drawn close, right into the very presence, right into the place that we can go into the holy, the holies of the Lord and stand before God, not in our righteousness or in our redemption, but is his righteousness and redemption because we've asked for the forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1.14, he tells, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Remember that everything that we have received, everything that the blessings, everything we have, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, is because of the redemption that we receive through the blood and the forgiveness of sin. We've been bought back from death and destruction. We've been bought back from the place of bondage and the place of corruption 
and brought into the place of forgiveness through the redemption of Jesus Christ. And just to, to verify that, he says a little bit further in 20, verse 20 of the same chapter 1, he says, And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. We get to experience and enjoy the peace of Jesus Christ through the blood of his cross. Now, Hebrews is going to go on and talk a lot about what Christ has done, but we're just going to pull one verse out of Hebrews chapter 9, verse, I believe, 12. He says, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's why we're told, don't keep sacrificing Jesus. He's done it once and for all. His blood only needed to be shed once. And he took that blood. He said not to go in now into the Holy of Holies with the blood of sheep and goats. That's, not, that's the old covenant. But the new covenant is now that that that, there, that Christ himself, as a high priest, took his blood into the Holy of Holies and did what? Sprinkled it over the mercy seat so that we could have redemption. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that something we should praise God for and continue to thank him for, for what he has done? Again, Peter talks about this. He says, but with the precious blood, of Christ as of the Lamb without blemish and without spot. And that's what our title was, the precious blood of Christ. We need to realize how precious it was because it was precious. And why was it so precious? Because the Lamb was without blemish or spot. There was nothing sinful, nothing disobedient within his entire being. He was without spot and he was without blemish. And that's why he could become the precious blood that would be given on behalf of us as he became our lamb. That's what it's referring to. John 1, 7, 1 John 1, 7. He continues this thought. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And this idea of blood doesn't stop because when we get into the book of Revelation, this concept of what the blood through redemption, through his righteousness, through all that he has done because of the shedding of his blood, allows us to be able to understand and experience what Christ has done. Because it's interesting in the book of Revelation, not very often is he talked about his name as Jesus Christ, but his name is often used as the Lamb of God or the Lamb. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, From Jesus Christ and faithful witnesses, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. This is starting off the book of Revelation, reminding us that even though what is going to take place on the earth, even though that uh, the terrible things that are going to be taking place, we do not have to worry because we can have peace, knowing that we've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that washing has given us redemption and covered us in his righteousness. In Revelation 5, 9, this thought continues on. Where it, under the title it says, Worthy is the Lamb. In verse 9 it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. That's what Jesus has done. He has redeemed us to God by his blood. Revelation 12, 11, again says, And they overcame him. Who is that? They overcame the beast. They overcame the enemy. They overcame him, how? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. And they did not love their lives till death. They were able to overcome, the people of God were able to overcome the beast and the enemy and the Antichrist now because they did not love themselves, but they were covered by the blood of the Lamb. And then our last scripture for tonight, at least 
for this study concerning the area of blood is really interesting. It's found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. He says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And it's interesting that when we go before him, I'm wondering if we're going to see him covered with a robe dipped in blood to remind us that we're in heaven today enjoying the presence of God because of his redemptive work through the shedding of his blood. He says he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. His name is called the word of God. He was clothed with a robe that was dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Remember in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Here is that reflection back again, all the way through. Thousands of years later, when we come to be with the presence of God, it reminds us that He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. I don't know about you how beautiful that is, but as we've just had that little bit of study, it's to remind us tonight how precious the blood of Christ is. Can you say with me, oh, how precious the blood of Christ is. Oh, how precious the blood of Christ is. Well, we're going to go back and now begin our communion service. And I'm going to ask Cohen to come and join us. You know, I don't know how many months now we've been doing evening communion together once a month. But tonight I hope that when we take a look at communion tonight that we will remember one more time how precious the blood of Christ is. And it's because of the shedding of the blood of Christ that we have fellowship with Him. Amen. Colin, why don't you come on and join us? Everybody's been waiting for you. Come on over so we can get nice and close into our little screen here. Cohen's my TV technician and camera lady. She's always hiding back there between the two cameras, making sure everything sort of works okay. But we're glad to have you here. Are you doing okay? Thank you. You want to say anything about your wonderful Thailand experience? I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> You're okay? I think she's actually a little camera, camera shy. I think yeah. she likes to be behind the camera <laughs> instead of in front of the camera. But I know what that is all about. But we're glad that she can join us. I thought just for a change, I you know, you can feel free to plug your ears if you want to. But we're just going to sing a couple verses of uh, hymn number 135. And it's called Nothing But the Blood. Can we try that, Colin? It says, okay. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're going to sing the last two verses after we finish having communion. So if you got your hymn book there, we're going to continue right on. But it's nothing but the precious blood of Jesus. And we're going over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And uh, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. He says, verse 23, For I have received from the Lord, which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, 
took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And tonight we want to continue to proclaim not only his death, but his resurrection and reclaim his redemption and his righteousness and his grace. All that we can claim and remember when we partake of communion. So I hope you got your bread ready. We've got our little cup, of, a little saucer of bread here. God bless you, Cohen. Why don't you take a piece here? Amen. The Bible says that this, this was broken for us. And this is what we give thanks for. So we're going to take a moment now just to pray and ask God's blessing upon this. This bread represents his broken body. Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to remember what you have done. And we thank you, Lord, that even for the brokenness of your body, Lord God, that we can call upon you and remember what you have done. So we ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless this element right now. And God, that it would help us to get deep in our minds and our heart exactly all that you have done for us. So we give you thanks now in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. He said, Take heed. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's so good to be able to have communion with you tonight. You know, we don't get out. Our churches and many of the churches in this side of the world are closed. And so it's such a joy that we can have fellowship with you tonight over the broken body of Jesus Christ. And now we're going to remember the cup. Cohen, I'm going to pass you the cup. And I'm going to take the cup too. And he said, you know, this cup represents the new covenant. Remember we talked about just earlier how the blood, how it was under the old covenant and how there needed to be a shedding of a lamb without spot or wrinkle or without, you know, any kind of blemish upon it. You know, it needed to be pure and right before God. And the blood was shed both for the, the household, for the Passover, for the tabernacle, for the priest of God. And you know what? We're priests of Jesus Christ too. But now we come into the new covenant where Christ shed his blood and went into the holies of holies. You know why? So that that veil could be torn in two and that we too, through the shedding of his blood. Can you imagine because of the shedding of his blood, we get to do several things. But one of them is that we get to go into his holy of holies daily and to come into his presence daily with him. And one day, we're also going to enter up into his kingdom and be with him for everlasting life. Amen. So let's just pray over the cup. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that this cup represents your shed blood. It represents your pureness, your holiness. It represents your righteousness. It represents your grace. It re represents your redemptive power. And Lord, how it has redeemed us from our trespasses and sins. And we thank you, Lord, for your willingness to come and to do that for us. And the Lord, that we can now, through having faith in you, to believe, O oh God, that you are making all things right for us and preparing a place in glory for us to be able to come into your very presence one day. So, Father, we ask now that you just bless this cup and help us to remember what it represents. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And amen. You know, Jesus held up the cup. He says, this cup is the new covenant. Again, the new covenant in my blood. This do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to close with our hymn and a prayer. 
And we're going to start off with verse 3 of nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now I'm going to pray a benediction and prayer upon all of us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your coming. We thank you for your work. We thank you, Lord, for being able to gather together, even though it's through the airwaves and through the Internet. But, Father, where two or three are gathered together in your name, you're in our midst. And, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your shed blood. And we thank you for how precious your blood is. And so I pray for everyone today that your hand will continue to be upon them, that they will be encouraged and strengthened and lifted up from this day forward as we place ourselves in your hands for your glory now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. We are so glad that you joined us, not only to hear another discipleship empowerment word, but also to have communion together. We're so 